tell them. Then they go ahead and tell them what they said they were going to tell them. <laughs> then when they get through, they tell them what they told them. <laughs> I don't know quite what the sequence will be, but I hope that the message today <clears throat> will protect all of you uh, from a chronic illness. Uh, where I'd like to get started, because we've got, I think you said I had, what, three hours? Is that right? <laughs> okay. All right. If you were a cardiac surgeon and you were deciding that you were going to hang out your shingle uh, in Okinawa, rural China, the Papua Highlands, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico, forget it. You better plan on selling pencils. Why? Because they never have cardiovascular disease there. Why? Because they're all whole food, plant-based nutrition without oil. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that this slide happens to be the oldest in my collection, 1968. I spent a year as a combat surgeon in Vietnam. And it reminds me to share with the audience that if we autopsy our young GIs, for instance in Korea, who have died in combat, 80% of those young soldiers, average age 20, already will have gross evidence of cardiovascular disease, you can see, without a microscope, but not enough for their cardiac events yet. So what was interesting was that that same study was repeated 45 years later. This time, looking at young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides, what did they find? Now the disease is ubiquitous. So is there anybody in this audience over 17? <laughs> Time is the time to start plant-based, yeah. Here we are in this country. You graduate from high school, you get a diploma, and you also get the foundation for coronary artery heart disease. Not a good plan. All right, we had a chance to get it right in World War II. In World War II, you may recall, uh, well, maybe some of you don't remember it at all. <laughs> when the Axis powers of Germany overran the Low Countries of Holland and Belgium, they characteristically took away their livestock for their troops. So, their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys, gone. Suddenly now these uh, <coughs> Western European nations became plant-based. and. Interestingly enough, uh, it was in England's leading medical journal, The Lancet, in 1951, <clears throat> Dr. Strong and Janssen looked at Norway to see the number of deaths from heart attack and stroke during that time period. So let's do this together. 1927, Norway, deaths from heart attack and stroke going up, 20, 1930, going up, 35, going up, 39, in come the Germans, whoop, right here, 40, whoop, 41. <laughs> Who knew these Germans were these great public health educators? <laughs> <laughs> but look what happened. In 1945, the death of Adolf Hitler, the cessation of hostilities in the European theater. Look, immediately, back come the meat. Back comes the dairy, back come the strokes, back come the heart attacks. Pretty, absolutely profound, but we just didn't get it. Now these next three or four slides will be the most important that I share with you today. If you're saying that the artery that you see on the right is severely diseased, I would say I agree. And you're probably saying, when that small opening finally closes off, there'll be a heart attack. Well, only about 10% of heart attacks may come from something this severe. 
Yeah, you're going to have chest pain, angina, shortness of breath, but this has taken decades to form. And as this is forming, and the downstream heart muscle cries out for more oxygen and nutrients, the body builds around the outside these tiny little threads we call collaterals, which is a sort of a, the body's own bypass. And what that does is it sustains the downstream cardiac muscle viability even when this closes off. But now let's look at the left. Even those of you in the back will be able to see that in a normal artery, this little tiny dark line, the endothelium, that's the absolute life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels. And all experts in this disease would agree that where this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we progressively injure this delicate innermost lining, the endothelium. We're going to talk about that for a few minutes. First thing that occurs when you have the milkshake and the cheeseburger and the pizza, things get sticky, sticky, sticky. Your white cells get sticky, your cholesterol gets sticky, your endothelial cells get sticky. But now we're going to go to the one that all of you have been asking me to show you. <laughs> <laughs> From Harvard, even though I went to Yale, <laughs> Peter Libby from Harvard, a great scholar of this particular area of the disease. Up here in the blue is where the blood is flowing. These are the tiny little purple cells, the endothelium, which separate the flowing blood from the wall of the artery. Now, to make sense out of this, let's start here in the upper left. There you are. That's the earth orange LDL cholesterol, which is now sticky, bumps up against the sticky endothelium, finds a crack, fissure, and opening, migrates into the subendothelial space where it doesn't belong, and immediately Peter Libby no longer has an orange, it's now yellow because it has been oxidized by these nasty free radicals, many of which come from the food we're eating. And as these particles get oxidized, the subendothelial space does not like that, calls upon the SWAT team, are white blood cells, which you can see here, Peter Libby from Harvard has painted blue in honor of Yale, and we like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the job of this SWAT team, this macrophages, to behave like Pac-Man, gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up, all these small, hard, dense, LDL particles until we get all the way over to here. When we in medicine do what we do so often, we change the name. It's now a foam cell. And the foam cell is truly the Darth Vader of this sequence of events. Why? Because the foam cell elaborates or manufactures these nasty, nasty products that we call metalloproteinases. If you want some names, stromelacin, elastase, collagenase, myeloperoxidase, what do they do that's so bad? What the foam cell metalloproteinases do that is so bad, it gradually erodes the thickness of the cap over the plaque till it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until it gets so thin that it now, with this, just with blood, racing over that thinned out cap, phew, it tears it. And suddenly we have now the extravasation or the oozing out of, if you will, of plaque content into the flowing blood, which activates our clotting factors, platelets. In a matter of minutes now, we're over here to be, a clot is forming, and the clot is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, bingo. We're all the way over to here. All the downstream muscle is deprived of oxygen and nutrients. That, ladies and gentlemen, is 90% of your heart attacks. Now, 
This plaque is blocking the artery by no more than 35%. And that's probably half the people walking around in Denver. You're not going to get symptoms until you're at least 75% blocked. But this poor individual, this is why you hear about time and again, so-and-so dropped dead of a heart attack, never had a symptom in his life. You don't get symptoms when you're only 35% blocked, but once you rupture it, in a matter, bingo, this is a... Now, if I do my job correctly today, every one of you and your friends and relatives should be able to make yourself heart attack proof. How are you gonna do that? We're not gonna do it with a pill. We're not gonna do it with a procedure. We're not gonna do it with an operation. We're gonna do it by changing your biochemistry. How are you gonna change your biochemistry? With whole food, plant-based nutrition, right? When you do this, you interrupt this entire cascade that I've just described. You'll no longer have things getting sticky. There will not be migration of the cholesterol into the subendothelial space. You will not have the SWAT team. You will not have the formation of Darth Vader, the foam cell. The cap over your plaque isn't going to get eroded and thin. It'll be strengthened. And if you strengthen the cap over your plaque, it cannot rupture. And if your plaque cannot rupture, you have made yourself heart attack proof. How long does that take you? We think maybe three weeks, if you do it right. Okay. Just when you thought I was through with the endothelial cell. Forget the x-ray. Here are the endothelial cells. Here is a plaque. Now, we used to think of the endothelial cells up until 1980 as these cute little red bricks that were lining these wonderful pipes of ours, okay? That all changed in 1980. Why? Because at that time, Dr. Fershkot in Brooklyn, who was doing studies taking the largest blood vessel in the rodent, the aorta, and he would do this sort of elliptical spiral staircase cut on it, all the way through the endothelium. Then he would immerse it in saline, and it would <laughs> vasoconstrict. One day, no cut, immersed it, it dilated. Did it again, dilated. Now, globally, the race was on. What was the EDRF? that Dr. Fershkot had discovered. Endothelial-derived relaxation factor. Kind of rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and thank heavens that term was with us only eight years. In 1988, Dr. Fershkot, Dr. Louis Gnaro, Dr. Murad discovered that the EDRF was a gas, nitric oxide. So, what was so exciting about nitric oxide? Well, those three men got the Nobel Prize in 1998 for that, but it was the functions of nitric oxide that make it so outstanding. One, nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. You climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, dilate nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will keep the wall of the artery from becoming thick and stiff or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four, here is the absolute key. A healthy, normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing blockages or plaque. Number five, nitric oxide will prevent the migration of muscles of artery of the wall of, of muscle of the artery wall from migrating into the plaque. And number six, nitric oxide can destroy Darth Vader 
the foam cell. Well now, the rest of that story is that Robert Vogel, Robert Vogel, who was uh, chairman of the Department of Cardiology at Maryland, took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant characterized by arches, which are gold. <laughs> <laughs> and half of the group had uh, the cornflakes. And then they had the test done that we do in research for nitric oxide, which is you take an ultrasound probe, put it over the brachial artery, and there on the screen is the readout of the diameter of your artery. Then for five minutes, you encircle the upper arm with a blood pressure cuff, which you inflate above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, you have zero blood flow to your forearm and hand. Now, I've done that, and it's not exactly habit forming. <laughs> <laughs> then you release the cuff, immediately remeasure the new diameter of the brachial artery, and the normal individual, it'll be 30% greater because of all the outpouring of nitric oxide from the endothelial cells during that time the tourniquet was up. So the subjects that had the cornflakes, brachial artery tourniquet test, after they ate it, normal. Those that had the hash browns and sausage within 120 minutes, when they tried the brachial artery tourniquet test, couldn't dilate. That single meal had so trashed, so injured, so compromised the capacity of their endothelial cells to make nitric oxide, they didn't have enough protect themselves. But as they followed them into the late afternoon, early evening, they began to recover. But you and I know the next morning for breakfast, it's going to be scrambled eggs and bacon. Lunchtime, white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise. And then at supper, baked potato with sour cream, lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, ranch dressing on a salad, and ice cream for dessert. Here in the good old USA, all day long, all through our lives, we absolutely annihilate, destroy the ability of our endothelial cells to make this wonderful gas, nitric oxide. And uh, this is what I just told you, so we won't have to go through that. <laughs> now, these are all four absolutely powerful uh, defensive mechanisms the body has. We have time today to discuss the endothelial cell, but let me reassure you that every single one of these is going to be totally enhanced when you're eating whole food, plant-based nutrition. So let's talk about a study. This was the first one I was involved in. It was a small study. Only 24 patients. Nothing against women, that's just the way they sent me the patients back in 1985. And uh, as my late brother in law used to say, these patients were Essie's walking dead. <clears throat> they had failed their first or second angioplasty, they had failed their first or second bypass, they were too sick for these procedures, or they had refused. And five were told by their expert cardiologists they wouldn't live out the year. Now, it was uh, interesting because. Because of my surgical obligations, uh, the group wasn't much larger, but it was so exciting what we began to see with this group. And the key thing here was I didn't want them to eat anything, anything. I didn't want them to eat anything that was going to endanger an already train-wrecked endothelium that brought them to my care in the first place. So, not a drop of any kind of oil. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil. <laughs> oil in a cracker, oil on a piece of bread, oil on a salad dressing. All right, no oil. And nothing with a mother or a, fa a face. Meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs. I don't like dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, sugary drinks, sugary foods. And I'm not a great fan of coffee with caffeine. However, that's just to help those of you who are skeptical about what I just said about oil. This is one of several peer-reviewed scientific studies clearly showing how oil can injure the endothelial cells. Now, there's an investigator at the Cleveland Clinic, Stan Hayes, 
Stan got interested in the microbiome and these particular molecules of lecithin and carnitine, which you regularly ingest if you are eating the Western diet, if you're an omnivore, listed here. All right, the problem is this. If you're an omnivore, you possess in your gut, your microbiome has bacteria that when they metabolize lecithin and carnitine, they make a molecule called TMA, trimethylamine, which is rapidly oxidized by your liver to trimethylamine oxide. And that seems to injure your blood vessels. Now here's the schematic. Lecithin and carnitine, gut bacteria, TMAO, vascular disease. And here, the exciting thing is this. He found out that if you took somebody who was totally committed to a plant-based diet, fed them a lamp shop, then measured their blood for TMAO, not there, or a tiny bit. Because plant-based people do not possess bacteria in their microbiome that can, uh, that can cause, or to, that can manufacture TMAO. And what does it do? That is, what does the uh, TMA do? It injures reverse cholesterol transport, it increases cholesterol deposition in the arterial wall. Uh, it's just in in 4,000 patients that they reviewed at the clinic, the most severe cardiovascular disease were those who had the highest rates of TMAO. And interesting, people often will say, well, I eat fish. Well, fish seem to yield the highest levels of TMAO. And here is something which is sort of an inhibitor. Dimethylbutanol inhibits TMAO formation. It's found in balsamic vinegars and red wine. However, the bottom line here is just do not eat those animal products that cause the problem rather than soak yourself with red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, this is something that is getting everybody's attention more and more, and that is, is cholesterol the bystander or is it the culprit? Here is a study, uh, the Cantos study. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, but briefly, uh, the agent that they use for uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and akinabob is a very, very aggressive immune suppressant. And they used it in about 5,000 men who'd had a heart attack at the control group, and then they had some that were having three different doses of canakinabob. It was fascinating that in the group that had lesser cardiac events, uh, the LDL cholesterol was not budged. It did not go down, down a bit and still they had rather significant uh, improvement in result, cardiac results. Sadly, thought, thought that improvement was offset by the fact that their immune system was so suppressed there were more deaths from infection and sepsis. But the point I'm trying to make is how important it is to see if the component of inflammation is in this disease. What do I want these patients to eat? All these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, and pasta. 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and some fruit. Now, something that, that I've added just in the last uh, six and a half, seven years, and it sets us apart a little bit, and that is that um, if you were a patient with heart disease and you could imagine shrinking your head to the size that could get inside the artery and see the plaque itself, you would see that the plaque is an absolute cauldron, a cauldron of inflammation. So we need antioxidants. No, do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work and it's going to be harmful. I want you to get your antioxidants from the food, fair enough. What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. Oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries on your morning oat cereal, that's a terrific start. However, nothing, nothing can trump the antioxidant value of a green leafy vegetable. So I ask these patients six times a day to chew, not smoothies, not juicing, to chew a green leafy vegetable roughly the size of their fist after it has first been boiled in water five and a half to six minutes so it's now nice and tender and then they must 
they must, they must then anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar. Why? Because the acetic acid in the balsamic vinegar has been shown to restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide, okay? Very exciting. And also, the green leafy vegetables have been shown to enhance the endothelial progenitor cells. They come from your bone marrow to replace your senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. All right, so if you are having these green leafy vegetables, you're gonna chew them alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich. That's three, mid-afternoon four, dinner time five, and God, I adore it when they have that evening snack of kale. <laughs> <laughs> What are the greens I'm talking about? They are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, <coughs> parsley, spinach, arugula, and asparagus. And the top six are kale, spinach, arugula, Swiss chard, and beet greens and beets. And look what it does for your memory. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I want to show you briefly some angiograms of disease reversal. These were all reviewed in the Cleveland Clinic and Geography Core Laboratory by senior technicians that do this all day long for national medical trials. So when I give you a percent of reversal, I know it's accurate. This is a 67-year-old retired pediatrician, left anterior descending. This is as small an improvement as the naked eye can see, 10% from here over to there on the right. The next one. A little easier to see, a 58-year-old factory worker looking at the circumflex artery to the back of the heart. This was a 20% improvement here to here. And then we have a 54-year-old security guard, the right coronary artery. This was described 30% here. Now this next fellow, chap first chapter of my book, uh, a colleague, he replaced me as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force, Joe Crow. 1996, age 44, Joe's getting chest pain. Doesn't smoke, not hypertensive, not diabetic, not overweight, regular exercises, no family history, chest pain. Cardiology works him up October of 96. No. Four weeks later, finished his surgical schedule, November. Sat down to write post-operative orders, boom! The elephant on his chest, jaw, shoulder, arm, having a heart attack. Whip to the cath lab, start the catheters, catheterization, cardiac arrest, resuscitate, finish the cath, one more cardiac arrest, resuscitate, and then he stabilizes and discharged three days later, but very depressed. Why? Because at the time of his cath, his left anterior descending, the lower one third, was all moth eaten and diseased over too long a segment to just hammer in stent after stent. Too far down the artery for bypass, so he was depressed. So Ann and I had Joe and his wife out for supper uh, two weeks after his heart attack. Joe, come on. You've been eating this horrible Western diet. You got the typical disease. Why don't you think about going plant-based? We've got 10 years of data. I said, okay, yes, I'll give it a shot but I'm not taking any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. Too many side effects. Fine, that's your call, no problem. He became the absolute personification of plant-based nutrition over the next two and a half years. And then he had another angiogram. And in our, uh, our offices are three doors apart. And at noontime, on the day I knew he Earlier that morning, I had the follow-up angiogram. I walked over, let myself into his office. There he was, sitting behind the desk. 
Joe, I wonder, I understand that you had to follow up angiogram early this morning. Mind sharing with me how did it go? Got up from his desk, came around, put his arms around me, a couple of Z's. He said, I think we're doing the, okay. He said, well, uh, would it be at all possible that I could see the uh, angiogram? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, sure. Wow. Now, this isn't gonna happen to everybody. Maybe a fourth of patients, but if the plaque is young and soft and made up of cholesterol, fat, and inflammation, the body has an excellent chance of doing something like this. So that's a quarter of a patient. Well, what about the other 70 or 75 percent who have old plaque, been there decades, made up of scar, fibrosis, calcification, not going anywhere? Even those patients can get the full benefit back to daily activity without restriction. And it's my obligation today to show you how those patients who can reverse their plaque in the epicardial coronary artery can make that happen, okay? So don't let me stop until I do that. But I'm not gonna do it now. <laughs> uh, so, we wanted to no, know, there were 18 patients who, of this original group who were stuck with us for the full 12 years. But I wanted to know, what happened in the eight years while these patients were under the care of expert cardiologists, how many cardiac events of worsening disease had they experienced? 49 events in these 18 patients, worsening disease as you see listed here. However, once they came with our program, we follow them now. I think this is probably the longest study of its type. 12 years, that's almost half a career. I mean, we really got to be on a first name basis. And what was exciting? When they were in our program, 17 of those 18 had no further events, but we did have, after six years, one of the little sheep who wandered from the flock. <laughs> got into the lamb chops, the french fries, glazed donuts, and so forth. More angina, had the bypass, but he's back with the flock, but proves the point that I'm sharing with you today. Okay. We got pretty well hammered on that study because people said, well, wait a minute. You know, this is pretty darn small. Dr. Esselstyn, how do you know if you can do it with a larger group and can you have the same results? So, in July of 2014, American Journal, uh, excuse me, the Journal of uh, Family Practice, we published another study. And this time, some 200 patients, two lost to follow up. But look what was happening. Adherent, over those four years, 89.3%, almost 90%. How, the most frequent message that I hear from cardiologists is, Dr. Esselstyn, I don't know how you get these results because I find that patients won't do this. Well, that's correct. If you tell patients in a 12 or 15 minute office visit to change their lifestyle. You've been smoking some. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. To make this happen, you've gotta show the patient respect. The only way I know to show a patient respect is to give them my time. And our program consists of, because 85% of our patients are from outside of the state of Ohio. I only get to see them once, but they've, found us over the internet or through the book or through the movie or what have you. And uh, I insist two weeks before they come to our seminar, which is six hours one day, always with a spouse who comes for free. You, if you're trying to do this without the spouse, you're dreaming, forget it. Both parties have got to be respected in this. But in that two weeks beforehand, my secretary gives me a list with their phone numbers and I personally call every one of these patients because I want to get my arms around their story at the same time, have a chance for them to ask questions of me so that when they do come to the seminar, we have a strong platform from which we can all move forward. And uh, I think that's really quite uh, absolutely key. All right, now, how do you know these people were sick? Well, look at the top. 119 of those 177 already had had a bypass or a stent, 
but was, what is getting to be a more fascinating number is the patients who come to us who were told they had to have a bypass or a stent, if they follow this, they're not gonna have to have it. Now, no question, let's be clear. If you're in the middle of having a heart attack, stent or, life, or a bypass can be absolutely life-saving, no argument. But when these are done electively, there is no prolongation of life, nor <clears throat> is there any protection from a future heart attack. So this is why we think these patients, incredible when you think about it, patients who are slated to have elective bypass or elective stents who are willing to make these lifestyle changes not going to have to have them. And <clears throat> so what we had in our group, we had one failure in the group that we were here. Actually, he wandered into uh, China, was eating off the economy, had a small stroke. There were 62% of those who were not adherent who had events. Now, what I did here was I tried to compare our results with some of the better known cardiovascular studies out there. Here we have cardiac events, heart attack, stroke, death. Over here, the Mediterranean study, the Immune Diet Heart Study, 25% at four years, heart attack, stroke, and death. New York, Columbia Presbyterian, Natural History of Heart and Disease, 20%. Bill Bowden's Courage Study, 19%. Here we are, six tenths of a percent. A 30-fold difference. What's different? What is so different? What's different is we are treating the causation of illness. And ever since the days of Hippocrates, there's been a basic covenant of trust that wherever possible, the caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. Sadly, today in cardiovascular medicine, that's not happening. However, I'm happy to say that three years ago, I was invited to become a member of the American College of Cardiology, and I'm now a member of the Nutrition Committee, which is led by no other than your prime physician in Denver, Andrew Freeman. to try to see and make this happen and uh, he can do this because <laughs> biologically he seems to have many more years ahead of him <laughs> than I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, How, now this is quickly, uh, there are a bunch of other uh, studies uh, that these are, this is, here's a study of what, 35,000 patients. You're looking at the degree of, uh, no, this is the one from Harvard. Uh, what Harvard found was that the individuals in this nurses' health study and health professional study, that those who were indeed, no, no surprise, closely, more closely following plant-based nutrition had a better uh, result. Now, I briefly want to share with you one, uh, one other study that I published in July of 2014, the same month. This time, only three patients. Why three patients? Because to me, these three patients absolutely personify the crazy approach that we have to this disease with drugs and procedures, all of which were colossal failures until they turned over. Uh, first, somebody I've not yet met. I've had letters from him. Bob Mercer lives in Newfoundland. And at age 44 in Canada, closes off his right carotid, has a stroke from which he recovers okay, but he has miserable angina. They found a surgeon in Toronto, courageous enough to operate on the guy, even though he only has one carotid left, which was then 23% long. He did well. Now he was 69 years of age. And he was in trouble again. He had diabetes. He had severe angina. He had uh, erectile dysfunction. And his one remaining carotid was 90% block. Of all things to have happened at this moment, his 37-year-old daughter, heart attack, in her convalescence, she somehow ran into a book <laughs> preventing reverse heart disease and said to her father, Pop, we got to do this together. A year later, I got a letter from him. Dr. Esselstyn. I wanted to say thank you. My daughter and I have followed your book. I've lost 40 pounds. I've lost my diabetes. I've lost all my angina. I've lost all my erectile dysfunction. And my one remaining carotid, 
which was 90% blocked, is now 67% blocked. So pretty exciting stuff. Now the other, oh here's a picture of Bob Mercer. The other gentleman is from Cleveland, Ohio, Mark Soteros, age 32, overweight, becomes diabetic. Age 42, angina, the first of 14 stents in the Cleveland Clinic. Then he's told, you know, you got this aggressive disease, the stents aren't doing it for you. You gotta have bypass, okay? Bypass, and that was good for a year and a half, more angina. Then he starts having stents into the bypasses. And then they say, you know, this isn't working. We're just going to have to work with drugs for you. He, uh, the parishioner told him about our program. He came, he lost 40 pounds, he lost all of his diabetes, and he regularly comes. Mm. And of course, this is another thing I think is so key. If you're pa counseling patients in a group, when you have somebody as articulate as articulate, his art can be about his story seven years ago. It's such a profound impact upon the patients there. Now, the last one was Jim McNamara, age 55, uh, overweight, has a small stroke, they operate on the carotid, and it fails and it totally occludes. Now, he somehow recovers from that nicely, but now he's got pain in his leg. And they say, you've got to have an operation on your leg. But before we do that, we have to clean out the one remaining carotid. And he was scared to death about that because of what had happened earlier, but that one did okay. Then they start on the leg. First operation failed, second operation failed, third operation failed. Listen, you got this aggressive disease. We'll have to just depend on drugs. And his wife found us over the internet, and he became totally compliant. Lost 40 pounds, lost his pre-diabetic state, and lost all of his uh, claudication or pain with walking. Here he is before on the left. Here he is, the dancing at his daughter's wedding. No more leg pain. All we did was get Jim to eat plant-based. So when you summarize and compare this approach with what your standard are getting, there's no mortality with the diet. There's no morbidity. And the interesting thing is there's no horrible side effects and there's no added expense because you got to eat. And the benefits do nothing but improve with time. And for the poor patients who've had a heart attack, they're simply walking around with the sword of Damocles hanging over their head. When do I get my next heart attack? Nonsense! You never have to have another heart attack. You make yourself heart attack proof with plant-based nutrition. Now, wait a minute. What is the good of having a great heart if your brain isn't there? We know that by the time you're 85 in Sweden or this country, 50% of people will have dementia. What kind of a reward is that for a lifetime of hard work? However, we got great insight into this from Megan Leary and her team from the West Coast who in 2001, reporting in the stroke meetings in Miami, looked at over 5,500 MRIs of the brains of Americans. And what did they find? At age 50, they begin to see little white spots. What are the white spots? <clears throat> stroke, but you know, big brain, tiny stroke, not a problem. Maybe not when you're 50, but now you're 65. 15 more years of the good old American diet. More often than before, you find yourself saying, sweetheart, huh, where did I leave the car keys? <laughs> Well, you get over that. Bingo, now you're 75. 10 more years of the good old American diet. Sweetheart, where did I leave the car? <laughs> <laughs> now, suddenly, you're 85. You look at her and you say, are you my sweetheart? <laughs> I can't reverse that. You don't suddenly wake up on your 85th birthday with dementia. You work hard in all those preceding decades to lay the foundation for that. Doesn't have to, doesn't have to happen. Now here is a normal MRI. Here is one. I counted 90 of these little strokes. Can you imagine a message trying to go through all that scar tissue? And here, what you're looking at, the skull is great. It's all 
Because it's right up against the brain here, not a problem. But what have we got over here? What's this big gap? Atrophy. You don't want cerebral atrophy. How do you prevent it? You exercise. If you're going to walk four or five times a week, almost fast enough to break a sweat, or you can bike and swim. And if we look at the muscles themselves, here on the left is a thigh, four-year-old triathlete. Here is a 74-year-old couch potato. Here is a 70-year-old triathlete. Message is pretty clear. Keep it going. All right. Now here is a patient who had to stop five times crossing the Skyway, coming to my office. So we got a pulse volume. Here it is. So we got all about his leg. So focused his heart. 11 months later, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, remember when I first saw you? I had to stop five times crossing the Skyway. Yeah. He said, you know, the last month it got to be four times, three times, two. I don't stop. Pain's gone. Back to the vascular lab. Bingo. It's now double what it was. And somebody's going to say, well, wait a minute. That's where the statins, didn't they work? <coughs> That's two patients this, today I've talked to you about. 1986. They didn't have statins. You don't have to have a statin to reverse this disease. You eat properly. Here's another. This happened to be a retired high school chemistry teacher. In his retirement, he and his wife absolutely enthralled about entering square dance contest. But in the fast square dance, he was getting bilateral calf pain. Saw some vascular surgeons. They got this image. He didn't like the idea of the big operation. So he found us over the internet, came for counseling, and uh, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I choose your method, how long will it take for me to get rid of this calf pain? So I looked at him with great wisdom in my face. <laughs> and said, probably about 10 or 11 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. <laughs> the pain is gone. OK. Now, I don't know what it's like here in Denver. But in Cleveland, if you are watching a sports program or a mystery, just before the advertisement comes on, you will hear the mellifluous tones of the advertiser say something like, when the moment is right, will you be ready? <laughs> <laughs> now, we all know the penile artery is really quite tiny compared to the coronary artery, so not infrequently before somebody comes down with heart disease, they may find they are no longer able to raise the flag. However, <laughs> all is not lost, not infrequently. 10 or 11 months after I've counseled somebody, I'll get a phone call, Dr. Esselstyn. Yes, this is Mr. So-and-so. I thought I ought to give you a call because recently something has come up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. <laughs> All right, now I promised you, before I wrapped it up, that we talk about how it is that if the plaque doesn't go away in the epicardial artery, you, get, you still get rid of your angina and you get back to regular activity. Here we have 248 cholesterol reading in a 60-year-old stockbroker. This is a pet rubidium dipritamol scan, okay? If it's yellow or orange, good perfusion. Terrible right here where it's green. I counseled him then. Ten days later, his cholesterol is down to 137. Then three weeks later, we repeat it. It's back. Three weeks. What's going on here? Obviously, we have restored enough of his endothelial cells that some wonderful things have happened with his additional nitric oxide. Here is the heart without any muscle. You are looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of interdigitating arteries. Now here are the epicardial arteries, the big ones on the top of the heart, the right coronary artery, the left anterior descending, the circumflex. Those are the ones that get all the publicity. They get the stents, the bypasses, and so forth. So I asked the Cleveland Clinic Cardiovascular 
pathologists who dissects 200 hearts a year from the deceased. How often do you ever see standard atherosclerotic heart disease in any of these arteries once they've entered the muscle? Never. Once in a very great while, maybe a severe diabetic. Otherwise, never. So what's going on? If we don't wash out the plaque, you don't wash out plaque in three weeks. But what has happened is this. When we first see these patients, all those thousands and thousands of vessels in their beaten down endothelium, the endothelium, when it's so beaten down, is no longer your friend. It's not making enough nitric oxide to make a difference. And it is now making two molecules that are working against you endothelin and thromboxane. Those two rascals are vasoconstricted. However, once you go totally plant-based and the endothelium from this massive amount of vasculature begins to recover, immediately making more nitric oxide, no longer making the vasoconstrictors, thromboxane or endothelin, this entire mass of vessels begins to dilate, right? And if you recall in physics, Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous is related to the fourth power of the radius translation. <laughs> Tiny increase in diameter, huge increase in flow. And we think that's what's happening to these patients, how they so rapidly get rid of their engine. So here's a summary of some of the things you see with coronary disease reversal. Angiogram we showed you, same thing seconds with happens with stress test. We talked about the PET scan, talked about the ultrasound with the carotid, talked about the pulse fine with the leg, and the reversal of the symptoms, angina, fornication, and erectile dysfunction. So now here, for the guys in Denver who don't see this, this is the A building where I worked for many years as a surgeon on the eighth floor. But I wanted you to see what the trees look like in Cleveland in February. <laughs> <laughs> However, now that I've retired from surgery and I've worked with the Wellness Institute, uh, the morale, uh, the, uh, the budget is rather modest, but the morale is really quite high. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that I've learned uh, in uh, 57 years since medical school, yes, uh, nothing, brains are important, but nothing, perhaps nothing is as important really as persistence, 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 best exemplified by this young damsel, Life Magazine, 1939, trying to learn how to do the splits, and she stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it, and sure enough, the other day, uh, let's see, and Swissdorf, downtown Denver, <laughs> spotted her, and she got it right. <laughs> now, both Andrew and, and I, Andrew Freeman and I are proud to have Kim Williams, who was the recent president of the American College of Cardi Cardiology, working on Andrews the Nutrition Committee. And it's really so exciting to think that leadership with really in leading cardiovascular physicians is taking a role in this. So I'd like to just wrap this up with a few words. While we've talked about cardiovascular disease today, medicine has never had before in its toolbox something as profound and powerful as whole food plant-based nutrition. There's no miserable expense, there's no horrible side effects, and the benefits endure. It not only takes care of heart disease, it eliminates diabetes, it eliminates strokes, vascular dementia, it also can eliminate uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, allergies, asthma, the list goes on. It's just as if the heavens have opened and said, here you guys, it's time you got it right.
because you see that truly the seismic revolution in health that is, a, is on our fingertips will never come about with a drug or procedure or an operation. The seismic revolution in, in health will come about when we in the profession, folks like yourselves, have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is indeed the lifestyle, and most specifically, what is the nutritional literacy that is going to empower them as a locus of control to annihilate chronic illness. Thank you.